In this video, we're going to talk about the protist supergroup Archaeplastida. The protist in the supergroup Archaeplastida are all descendants of a heterotrophic protist that formed a symbiotic relationship with the cyanobacterium. And this cyanobacterium, these are photosynthetic bacteria. And so this is likely a case of endosymbiosis. in which the protist, by taking in the cyanobacterium, was now able to perform photosynthesis. On the next several slides, we're going to talk about some of these uh, specific subtypes of the RK plastida. So we're going to talk about the glaucophytes, red algae, and then the green algae, which are further divided into chlorophytes and carophytes. So here's a picture of a glaucophyte. And glaucophytes, you can see that they have these chloroplasts, these green things in them. And they have remnants of a peptidoglycan cell wall, which is likely from the cyanobacterium that was engulfed during endosymbiosis. Red algae are also in the supergroup Archaeplastida. The red algae are also known as rhodophytes. Most of them are multicellular, and they have a second cell wall outside of a cellulose cell wall. And the second cell wall is made up of carbohydrates that uh, we can use, so we as humans can use these carbohydrates in order to make agarose and agar. So agarose is just the gel-like substance, um, it's kind of like jello or gelatin, that is involved in gel electrophoresis. And gel electrophoresis is used for things like DNA fingerprinting. Agar is the solid bacteria medium that can be mixed with different nutrients in different conditions in order to culture bacteria on a Petri dish in a lab. The red color of red algae comes from these red pigments known as phycoerythrins. So the red algae are able to do photosynthesis, but they don't appear green because the red pigment kind of takes over the green pigment of the chloroplast. Now there are some red algae that do not have the phycoerythrins and they are actually parasitic. And red algae can be found in freshwater or saltwater and is typically found in tropical areas. Now the green algae are the most abundant group of algae and they are also classified in the supergroup Archaeplastida. Now there are two subtypes of green algae. There are the carophytes and the chlorophytes. And we're gonna talk about those on the next couple slides. So first we'll talk about the carophytes and these are actually the closest living relative to plants. They are similar in morphology and reproduction to plants which is one reason why they're classified that way. They are often found in aquatic or wet environments, as you can see in this picture here. And the presence is actually a sign of a healthy ecosystem. So a lot of that algae you see in a pond isn't necessarily a bad thing. One example of a carophyte are the spirogyra. And you can kind of see that in this picture here. Like they kind of have this like spiral shape inside of them. Now the green algae known as chlorophytes are found in freshwater and damp soil and they help to make up plankton. And plankton is a term given to essentially um, microscopic or other usually fairly small organisms that essentially are carried by currents and tides. They can often swim a little bit, but they can't swim strong enough to go against a current or a tide. 
And plankton also makes up the base of the aquatic food chain. especially the photosynthetic plankton. There are also zooplankton, which are small single-celled organisms usually that eat the photosynthetic plankton. Now there are four subtypes of chlorophytes. We've got the Chlamydomonas, Volvox, Ulva, and Calerpa, and we'll talk about those on the following slides. So the chlamydomonas are unicellular and pear-shaped. So this is just a single cell right here. They have two flagella coming out of them. And they actually have an eye spot that can detect light. And so if they see light, they can actually swim towards it. The Volvox protist has two flagella inside a hollow spherical matrix made of gelatinous glycoprotein. So you can kind of see this matrix here, and then you've got these um, smaller organisms inside. Now these are unicellular organisms, but they are colonial, which means that they actually work together. So they're cytoplasmic bridges that physically connect cells, and the colony moves as a single organism. So they actually coordinate their movement so they can move all together. And only some of the cells in the colony produce offspring. So there's a little bit of specialization that occurs within the colony. Now, this does not make it a multicellular organism because these cells are able to live independent of each other. In a true multicellular organism, if you were to remove a single cell, it would not be able to survive on its own. Ulva is another type of chlorophyte, which is a type of green algae, which is the type of archaeoplastida. Colloquially, this is known as sea lettuce, and this is a multicellular organism. Calerpa is another type of chlorophyte that has flattened fern-like foliage. Interestingly, the cells go through mitosis without cytokinesis. So if you recall, mitosis is the splitting of the nucleus, whereas cytokinesis is when the rest of the cell, so the cytoplasm, organelles, and cell membrane all separate. So when this happens, you end up with these really large cells that have multiple nuclei in them because the nucleus and the chromosomes are being copied, but that cytokinesis is not splitting them up. So to summarize the supergroup, so we were talking about the Archaeoplastida, which can be broken down into three subgroups. We have the Glaucophytes, the Red Algae, also known as rhodophytes, and the green algae. The green algae was further broken down into two additional subgroups, the caraphytes and chlorophytes. And then there were four different types of chlorophytes that we discussed. There are the chlamydomonas, the volvox, ulva, and calerpa.